important webinar. Thank you for your interest in this important webinar on critical race theory. I'm Connie Kindler, PASA's consultant for professional development. And also with us from PASA is Dr. Mark DiRocco, our executive director. Before we get started, I would like to remind all to please keep your mics muted. And if you have a question uh, or a comment, please post it in chat and we will address them following the webinar. webinar. At this time, it's my pleasure to introduce our special guests, Dr. Shayla Griffin and Dr. Serena Shivers. Dr. Griffin is the co-founder and facilitator of Justice Leaders Collaborative, the education justice consultant for the Washtenaw Intermediate School District in Michigan, author of Those Kids, Our Schools, Race and Reform in an American High School, and co-author of Race Dialogues, a facilitator's guide to tackling the elephant in the room. Dr. Serena Shivers is a former superintendent who now serves as Deputy, Deputy Executive Director of the Michigan Association of Superintendents and Administrators. She has been an external reviewer for Advance Ed National Accreditation Institution, a national consultant for the college board in their college readiness division, a data teams trainer, and trained to be a restorative practices facilitator and a teacher of graduate level courses in culturally responsive teaching. Want to welcome Dr. Griffin and Dr. Shivers, and thank you for being with us today. Thank you for having us, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you, Connie, for introducing me. Um, I want to just give a little bit of background before I introduce Dr. Griffin, who's going to be the main person that you hear from this afternoon. As Connie said, I am the Deputy Executive Director of Michigan's Superintendents Association, having left the superintendency a little over a year ago. So I've been in your seat. I've been a superintendent, a principal, teacher, central office administrator, transportation director, all of the, those good things. Um, my work in social justice and equity, I feel like has come full circle. And it takes me back to the year 2000 when I was in Indiana, um, a principal, and I was teaching my first cultural proficiency course. I don't even think you know this, Shayla, at Butler University. So it's been about 21 years that I have been doing some work around um, equity, social justice, cultural proficiency, and those very, very important topics. As Connie mentioned, Dr. Griffin works for Washtenaw Intermediate School District, which is in Ann Arbor. It is a regional educational agency. We have those in Michigan. I don't know if they exist, exist in Pennsylvania, but that is where Dr. Griffin and I met. Um, back around the time that we were both there, she's still there. We were working with the University of Michigan's Museum of Natural History, which was bringing a, a traveling exhibit race are we so different to the Ann Arbor area and the school districts in Ann Arbor. That morphed and ebbed into um, a, a workshop that we did for all educators that were in that county. And I, I'm so thrilled to know that Dr. Griffin and now her team is still doing this critical work and, and my goodness, what they have created and, and what Shayla has brought to this work based on her expertise and her knowledge and her experience. They've assembled quite a team and you'll have to visit their website to learn a little bit more about them. When I took the role as a deputy executive director, one of the call of action for our state association was to do this work statewide, not to lead, not to just be leading the work, but to be leaders in this work. And I could not think of a better person that I needed shoulder to shoulder and knee to knee with me doing this work and leading this work other than Dr. Griffin. So I reached out to her and her team and said, hey, would you help me and be a part of me developing and shaping this work statewide? So we just launched in August what is called Beyond Equity. And if you go to our gomasa.org website, you can learn a little bit more about it. But it is an 18-month commitment we have 14 school districts across the state of Michigan, every region but one in our state is represented that, are, that have committed 18 months for the superintendent and his or her team 
to reimagine, to redefine, and to disrupt issues of inequities in their school district. So for me, I have gone from doing this work regionally, doing this work as a superintendent, to be honored to do this work at a statewide level and impact the entire state of Michigan. We have 10 school districts already on our waiting list for the next cohort, and we haven't even opened up the application process for that next group. So there's a deep, deep commitment for here, for this work here. As I'm sure all of you experienced, um, critical race theory kind of weaved its way into this conversation around diversity, equity, and inclusion. And when my superintendent said, help, because we, we really need some, some, we need to know what is this first of all, and why are we here and what is, the argument behind critical race theory and how should we best navigate this waters? I again knew no better person than to call than Dr. Griffin. So she's been sucked and glued to me at the hip, <laughs> whether she wanted to or not. And so it's my honor and my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Shayla Griffin, who's going to take it from here. Great. Thank you so much for having me, Pennsylvania. I'm really excited to be here with you all today and get to talk to you all about critical race theory. Some folks who are, have already said who I am, so I won't go too far into that, but I will just say if you want to know more about my work, you can go to our website at Justice Leaders Collaborative. We do social justice education, training and coaching, and really have shifted to a virtual model, so are doing a lot of stuff really with people all over the country at this point. Um, uh, they mentioned a couple books I've written. I'm also writing a children's book, A Guide to Race for Kids Who Want to Change the World and Grown Ups Too, and so um, be on the lookout for that as well when that comes out. So what are we gonna do today? I'm gonna talk to you all first about what critical race theory actually is, and this will be a very brief overview. Um, then we're gonna talk a little bit about why this is coming up now, why everyone is talking about it, and how I think leaders should respond, and then we'll do some Q&A. Um, I'm really honored to work in partnership with uh, MASA, and I wanna say, um, I'm speaking for myself, so if I say something here, like, I don't know if I agree with that. That's not, the, it's not a reflection of MASA, this is just the Shayla Reese Griffin perspective on what I think should be happening here. Um, so what is actual critical race theory? And I wanna be really clear, I'm saying actual, because as I'm sure you really figured out already, the conversation about critical race theory is kind of confounding like this old theory with kind of a movement against what is really not exactly critical race theory. And I just wanna be clear, I'm gonna to try to kind of tease that apart for you a little bit today. So actual critical race theory is kind of two things. It's both obscure, it's this legal theory that honestly not many people have heard of that emerged in a very specific time and context. I'm gonna to talk to you about that time and context and what that is. And it's also quite honestly widespread. It is a theory that has had significant influence on what I would say are now in 2021, the agreed upon ways that we think about race and racism in our country. And I wanna give you a little insight about both of those kind of things. So this is for you. This is a reflection question for yourself. And I just wanna say, this is really the, the question that motivated um, actual critical race theory. Why? Even after the gains of the civil rights movement, does racial inequality persist in our country? So imagine you had a student or a parent or a colleague ask you this, hey, I'm looking around, why do we still have these systems that are unequal when we did that civil rights thing? How would you respond? Do you have an answer? So these are the good check-ins you can just do for yourself, like that might indicate some of your own learning and where that might need to happen. But this is really what critical race theory was responding to. So as I'm sure you know, there was lots of civil rights legislation um, in the mid 60s that gave people of color protection under the law Two in particular, the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which declared no segregation in public places, no discrimination in employment based on race, gender or national origin. And then also the Voting Rights Act, which was passed in 1965, which um, aim to protect African-Americans right to vote under the 15th Amendment of the Constitution and outlaw discrimination in voting. Also provided more kind of um, legal oversight around voting. So both of these things passed in 1964 and yet racial inequality continues. Why is that, right? Why didn't these laws fix it? And so the very short version of critical race theory is that it was really a tool for understanding why after all these legal gains, racial inequality persisted 
And I'm gonna talk about this more. Critical race theory really argues that racism is actually not really just about individual beliefs or individual behaviors. Instead, critical race theorists are saying racism has been baked into our laws and our systems. And I'm gonna give you some examples. So let's talk about the obscure part of critical race theory. <laughs> So it was developed in the 1970s and 1980s by academics primarily connected to Harvard Law School. I wanna be really clear, and I'm sure you all have figured this out by now, like this is a pretty old kind of theoretical perspective at this point. Um, it was all these Harvard Law School professors and students that were saying like, hey, we did the civil rights thing, it's now the 70s, we are still seeing inequity, what is happening here? And they started to really say, you know, maybe law isn't neutral. So I just want to be clear, before critical race theory, the understanding of how law works was like law was just this neutral arbiter, right? It didn't have anything to do with, um, you know, like uh, there was no bias in the law, was the assumption. And critical race theory started saying, maybe that's not true. Maybe the law and our legal system really are playing a role in the continuation of racial inequality. And so these theorists produced tons of academic scholarship. There's books, there's articles, there were conferences, law school courses really over the past 40 years. Um, and you know, if you're interested in this, I think you should be, there's tons to read. Like if you want to know more about what critical race theory is, like there are so many articles and books and stuff that you could go pick up that like it would be easy for you to do. Um, and I just wanna be clear, you know, critical race theory scholars don't agree on everything. Critical race theory is just a way of thinking about the world that allows for dialogue among academics trying to make sense of the world. But it's not like, you know, a tried and true, it's not like here, here's all the things that we believe. It's like, you know, it's a debate, it's a conversation, it's an academic kind of way of thinking about the world. So just a snapshot of some of the critical race theory scholarship. So Derek Bell, Kimberly Crenshaw, lots of names here you may have heard being talked about recently. Um, wrote a lot of books. Derek Well, Bell's first book, um, Race, Racism and the Law, and I'm sorry, in American Law, came out in 1972, which that course at Harvard was then based on. Faces at the Bottom of the Well came out in 1992. I want to point out, I put dates here on purpose. Um, there was a, this, this reader that um, uh, Kimberly Crenshaw and others wrote, critical race theory, the key writings that formed a movement. This was the reader reflecting on kind of the history and con conclusions and findings and debates around critical race theory. It came out in 1995, right? So over 25 years ago, we were already writing the like <laughs> summative books about critical race theory. So I just wanna emphasize like critical race theory itself is a very old thing. This is not new. It's kind of been plucked out of history for this moment, right? Okay. And so I encourage you to go read some of these things if you want to. Critical race theory though is not just obscure, it also has had widespread contribution to our understanding of race and racism. So even though to me, the term critical race theory and a lot of its components really haven't been utilized outside of you know, the academy, some of its conclusions are now taken for granted by scientists, social scientists, historians, anyone committed to racial justice. So I just wanna say, I've been doing social justice and equity training and work for like, I don't know, a long time, my whole career. And we never, I never used the term critical race theory until this year, until it came up, right? Um, but critical race theory very much has informed some of that work. And there are two things in particular that I think critical race theory has really raised up. One is the idea that race is not biological. It's a social construct. So I wanna be really clear. If you are a person that you know is concerned about race or equity, this is agreed upon. This is not controversial. This is just how we understand race now. So critical race theory lifts up the finding of geneticists and other scientists that humans cannot be genetically or biologically separated into different species or groups. Instead, racial categories are basically made up, right? Some people call that a social construct. Racial categories are made up by people for social and economic purposes. And so what this means, the implication of race not being biologically real is that racial inequality can't then be attributed to biological or genetic differences. Um, this image you see is from a art project, called, a, a photography project called Humane by Angelica Das, who's a Brazilian photographer. She had this goal to take pictures of humans and match human skin colors to the Pantone colors, which are like the, you know, the color swatches you get at the paint store. I think at last check, she had found over 4,000 different skin colors. And the point of this is just that you can look at these people and see that like 
people that might identify in very different ways racially have similar skin colors and people that identify in the same way racially have different skin colors. And this biology of race isn't really a thing, right? So that's the first thing that we now understand to be just truth that critical race theory really didn't discover, but raised up for us. The second contribution that I would say critical race theory has made to our now common understanding of racism is the idea that racism is a system. And so you might hear terms like structural racism or institutional racism. And so this is the idea that racism is not just about individual animus or the actions of a few bad actors, that it's embedded in our laws and policies. So even if no individuals acted with racial animus, even if you were really nice to like all the people you met from different racial backgrounds, racial inequality would persist because it's a part of how our systems, our schools, our healthcare systems, our criminal justice system, our government, et cetera, are structured. And so that was really the perspective of critical race theory that made a contribution. And you might know now if you do any kind of racial justice work, this idea of structural or institutional racism is commonplace. It's just accepted. It's not, this is just how we think about race now, right? So let's look at two examples of how this critical race theory lens might play out. Okay, so the first example, we know uh, from data that fam white families have many times the wealth of black families. So what you're looking at right now is a graph that shows the median wealth of white and black families from 1989 to 2016. The red bar is black families, the, the blue bar is white families and you can see from the survey of consumer finances that white families have had many times the wealth of black families since 1989 through 2016 of this graph. And, and as we know before and after as well. Why is that? So this is another check for yourself. Have you thought about that? Do you have an explanation? If a student asks you, could you tell me? So there's kind of two possible explanations here. The first explanation is black people maybe don't work as hard. Black people don't know how to save. Black people are lazy, right? So that's one kind of group of ideas that might explain the racial wealth gap. There's another group of ideas that might explain the racial wealth gap that are more complicated, right? And so this is just a kind of tip of the iceberg, but you might say white people were actually put at an economic advantage starting with the founding of our country as a result of many things. One, the theft of indigenous lands and the enslavement of black people, racially discriminatory policies that were not legally addressed for hundreds of years, some of which still continue. Um, redlining and other discriminatory housing policies and practices that have allowed white families to accrue wealth through their homes while denying that opportunity to black families. And then our system of investing, which allows wealth to compound over time. So if you started with more 100 years ago or 200 years ago, you're always gonna have more even if other groups make financial gains. And so these are explanations for the same thing and they're very different explanations. And the first explanation is rooted in racism and eugenics, right? That like something is ultimately wrong with black people and that's why they don't do as well. The second explanation, which people who support kind of critical race theory and racial equity and racial justice is really rooted in critical race theory, which is like something is wrong with our systems that have given unfair advantage to some groups and unfair disadvantage to others, right? So, so if you were having that critical race theory lens, you would go with that explanation number two. And I just wanna emphasize again, Prior to critical race theory really raining a foothold, most people thought the explanation was number one. We basically, we basically had eugenics. We basically assumed something's wrong with these other groups, right? Let's look at a second example that might be more uh, close to home for you all in terms of schools. So similar question. We know that when it comes to standardized test performance, black students do not perform as well as white students. So this bar graph you're looking, or this uh, line graph you're looking at is um, trends in NAEP reading, average scores, the, the reading gap for white and black 17 year old students. And you see this red line at the top is white students. You see the black line at the bottom is black or below it is black students. And this goes from 1971 to 2012. And so you see there's been a racial, um, a, a racial gap in reading scores for decades. And I'll just say it's not, it, you know, it's not closing, like it just persists, right? Why is that? So a student asks you that, a teacher asks you that, a parent asks you that, what is your explanation for why we have this gap? Again, there's kind of two versions, right? One version, maybe black people just aren't as smart. They're just not as good at reading. Black people don't work as hard. Maybe black people are bad parents. 
maybe black people don't care about education, right? So that's one kind of ways of thinking about it, that something is wrong with the black students and their families and their communities. A second explanation, white students are put in an economic advantage based on the very ways we design schools and society as a result of lots of different things of which these are just a few, right? Having more access to our access to wealth and resources. So that goes right back to that first example, right? Um, Segregated schools with funding models that are, have historically been based on local taxes that lead to predominantly white schools being better funded with more qualified teachers. Curriculum that's largely focused on the histories and contributions of white people. Discipline policies that unfairly target students of color, specifically black students in this case, and by a standardized testing. And so again, these are two different explanations for the same um, inequities that we're witnessing. And as you might guess, the first explanation is basically racist, right? <laughs> and the second explanation would be more aligned with a critical race theory perspective. So I just wanna summarize kind of actual critical race theory. And I, I hesitate to say summarize because as you might guess, I mean, critical race theory, like, I mean, I encourage you all to go read some of these books. They are dense. They are like dense legalese. They are looking at court decisions and cases and, trying to dissect them in specific ways. And so the reality is like the average person is not gonna read critical race theory in depth because it really is specifically about lawyers talking about the law. And there are parts of it that now are taken for granted. And those parts I just mentioned, racial inequality is not the result of something inherently inferior about certain groups. If you believe that, that's racist, that's racism, that's eugenics. Racism is not about the actions or animus of individuals only, right? Racism is a system that gives unearned advantage to people who are white and unearned disadvantage to people of color. It persists even if no individuals are consciously acting in bigoted ways because it's baked into our laws, our policies, our practices. And this has pretty much been accepted for decades by anyone who's doing kind of social justice or equity or diversity work. This isn't a new thing. Well, that's a little bit about critical race theory. Um, I do encourage you to go look into it more and read some more about it. So why is everyone talking about critical race theory now, which is pr probably the more kind of relevant piece? I would say there is an organized movement to stop progress. So what we are witnessing with the anti-critical race theory movement is really just backlash against social and racial progress that's been spurred on by a number of things that have happened in, I would say, the past you know, four or five years. One, the Black Lives Matter movement, which really picked up steam after the killing of George Floyd by police. So like that Black Lives Matter movement kind of started some years back and then got kind of a restart um, after the George Floyd killing. Um, the popularity of the Pulitzer Prize winning 1619 project, which was spearheaded by New York Times journalist Nicole Hannah-Jones. That project really centers the role of the institution of slavery in the formation of the United States. Um, and gotten a lot of attention, um, rightly so, and also a lot of uh, a lot of backlash. So that kind of happened at the same time. We had an election just last year in 2020, Joe Biden won, and then both Georgia's Senate seats flipped from Republican to Democrat um, for the first time. And then that reignited far-right resentment leading to the revolt of January 6th. And so all of this is really about this national racial reckoning, was happen a reckoning that's happening. And it's led organizations, schools, businesses, government agencies, across the country to really say they're committed to racial equity and justice. And so you can go to basically any, you know, corporation in America and they have a statement on Black Lives Matter or a statement on equity or a DEI consultant, right? Like this is really a, a, a place where people who um, kind of support progress are, are coming out in support of equity and, and that's happening at a national scale. And so what we're seeing is identical bills are being passed in states across the country that would ban the teaching of what I would call fake critical race theory. And these bills really are trying to kind of include anything related to race and racism. And so we're gonna talk a little bit about what that is. And I just wanna say, I'm really trying to distinguish now between actual critical race theory, right? Which we just talked about and critical race theory as framed by this backlash movement. So who is behind the anti-critical race theory or movement just to start? Um, really, this is a movement by far-right think tanks, media outlets, and leaders. So it kind of started with Christopher Ruffo. He's from the Manhattan Institute, and he convinced former President Donald Trump to ban diversity training in federal departments. You might, you might remember, this was kind of a big deal for just like a hot second um, right before the election. Um, people in my field, at least, were like kind of panicked because they felt like they were going to have all these contracts to do diversity training canceled. Um, and he really got 
this Christopher Rufo really got into this critical race theory thing, um, convinced Trump, and then really admitted quite publicly uh, to using critical race theory as an umbrella term for stopping progress. So what you see on the right are two tweets from uh, Rufo. Uh, the first one is kind of hard to read, but I'll read it to you. We have successfully frozen their brand, critical race theory, into the public conversation and are steadily driving up negative perceptions. We will eventually turn it toxic as we put all of the various cultural insanities under that broad category. The goal is to have the public read something crazy in the newspaper and immediately think, critical race theory. We have decodified the term and will recodify it to annex the entire range of cultural constructions that are unpopular with Americans. So they're being pretty upfront about what they're trying to do here is that they really are just using critical race theory as kind of an umbrella term for any kind of cultural things that um, the far right isn't interested in. And, and we're gonna use this as kind of the beginning. The far right Prager University um, then produced a video that went viral in those circles, flaming the fires of the risk to white Americans of learning about racism. And so a lot of folks saw that video on social media. Uh, legislators around the culture, the country, like rep, um, like your rep in Pennsylvania, um, have 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 been then spearheaded bills against critical race theory. I want to point out these are the um, same reps who are spearheading the anti-transgender bills around sports, and so um, this idea of stopping progress related to gender and race are very much connected. This is the same people doing this, and then Fox News, um, which discussed critical race theory over thirteen hundred times from February twenty. 21 to June 2021. And so you see this graph here on the right of Fox News mentions critical race theory, how much they were talking about it in February, and then how that really exploded. So this really is an organized effort of the far right to really to, to, to take to use this as a cudgel. And I think that it's honestly fake critical race theory, you know, it just was the right time and the right name. Like I think if critical race theory were called anything else this would not be the thing being used. So its name and its origin in law school really taps into far right fears about threats of elites. So the name, it's got critical in it, it's got race in it, you know, it's got theory in it. Um, and the folks that are um, kind of leading this movement are falsely claiming it includes practically anything related to race or progress, including things like social and emotional learning. So on the left, you're gonna see this um, meme that was going around. It says how to identify critical race theory in the classroom. And so this is like supposed to be targeted at parents to say, hey, your schools might say they're not doing critical race theory, but if they're doing any of these things listed, they are. And here's the kind of things on it. CRT, critical race theory, or culture responsive teaching, which just to be clear, are two totally different things, but they have the same initials, right? Right name. Um, equity, diversity, and inclusion, cultural, multicultural competence, implicit, unconscious, internalized bias, social justice, or restorative justice, systemic, structural, institutional racism or oppression, microaggressions, anti-racism, white privilege, fragility, supremacy, culture, prejudice, CQ, like IQ, but cultural intelligence, colonialism, neocolonialism, colonizer, decolonialism, power structures or racial hierarchies, normative, disparate outcomes or inequity, identity, ally or allyship, Afrocentric, Eurocentric, social constructs, Black Lives Matter, reparation, liberation, ethnocentricity. So they're trying to say to parents, hey, if your school is doing any of this, they're doing critical race theory and critical race theory is bad. Um, other ones I've seen include, I already said social emotional learning. I saw one that included reflective exercises. Like if your school is doing reflective exercises is secretly critical race theory. And so, you know, these folks who are trying to pass these bills and are upset are really falsely claiming that critical race theory, I keep putting this in quotes because you see this is not really connected to the actual theory of critical race. Um, they, they falsely claim that it's intended to teach white people to hate themselves. And in fact, critical race theory actually challenges the idea that there's inherently differences in racial groups and really challenges the idea that racism is about individual behaviors. So the narrative of critical race theory of the far right and actual critical race theory are, are not really the same. Why would this work? How is it supposed to work? So, you know, really what is going on is fear mongering that's building on a tradition of moral panics that taps into long held fears of many white Americans that they're gonna lose something if people of color are treated more fairly. Um, and so critical race theory is the latest example, you know, the mass debate is, the, the, maybe that's really the latest one. There were examples before this, there will be examples after. Um, this idea of moral panics about change. And so there's two books I really wanna to recommend to you. 
Um, one is called the Other School Reformers, which is really about how um, this has happened before that um, conservative folks or, 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 or far right folks have come out and really tried to stop um, teaching of true history in schools over the course of the history of the United States. So that's a good book that really delves into how this is, it doesn't, it's not about critical race theory, but puts this in context and align of these kinds of efforts. Um, and The Sum of Us by Heather McGee, The Sum of Us, What Racism Costs Everyone and How We Can Prosper Together, really also talks about those fears of many white Americans that they're gonna lose something. And so the willingness of some segments of our population to really um, wanna stop things that really would benefit them as well um, out of fear that it might benefit people of color. Um, it's also supposed to work through like disinformation, which is really targeted at the base and those susceptible to far-right influence. And so this idea that white children are gonna hate themselves is something that a lot of um, folks have been pushing um, and, and really trying to capitalize on those fears that, of parents. You know, in fact, telling the truth about racism benefits all of us, so white people too, right? Um, it's working through propaganda, you know, attacking critical race theory. Um, it's so interesting. like. The, I didn't go, I'm not gonna go too far into the rabbit hole on this, but like a lot of the things in the bills that are being proposed, they, they contradict their own arguments, even in the messaging. And it really, they're counting on their audience not to notice, like not to do the reading, not to ask further questions. And so it's just like this kind of confusion um, that is being, being promoted. And it's also supposed to work as a scare tactic. So it's really scaring educators from addressing these subjects, from addressing race, even if there aren't laws against it. Um, by bombarding local school board meetings. And so I just wanna know if you are folks who are getting folks at your meetings, you know, a lot of the people showing up to protest critical race theory at school board meetings aren't even parents in those districts, right? This is a large campaign. Folks are sending activists to go to school board meetings to kind of cause uproar. And so a lot of school leaders are having to respond to people kind of in their face who aren't even representative of their actual community. Um, and that's one I highlighted because I think this is the real danger that I want to make sure you all are um, aware of, that even if laws don't get passed, if, if educators are being told it's too risky to talk about this, um, the, the anti-critical race theory movement still basically achieves its goal, right? Why does this work? You know, I would say... My short answer is because in the United States, we learn very little about the history and present reality of race and racism, which makes us vulnerable to disinformation and misinformation. In short, you know, there's just a lot we don't know. So what you're looking at here is an excerpt from a New York Times article. I encourage you to go look at the whole thing. It's very interesting and it shows, um, it's an expose on the textbook industry and it compares in this slide, what you're looking at is two different books, um, one that California adopted about United States history and geography, one that Texas adopted, both from McGraw-Hill. And they differently explain white racism to black progress um, in the 50s. So in the California one, it says, movement of some white Americans from cities to suburbs was driven by a desire to get away from more culturally diverse neighborhoods. So it's noting the suburban dream of 1950s was really inaccessible to many African-Americans. The Texas book says, some people wish to escape crime and congestion of the city. So Texas doesn't do that. And so we really, you know, it is my opinion, you can go read anything I wrote, you can Google me, that like we have a real crisis in education, which is because we are not teaching accurate history, um, then we have adults who don't know our history. And then the, fl the, faint, the flames can kind of get fanned and they are susceptible to falling kind of prey to that because we haven't done a good job of educating them K through 12, K through university, right? And so this really, I think in a lot of ways is kind of an indictment of the, our failure to kind of teach history um, you know, in our country. So what's the goal? Why is this anti-critical race theory movement happening? And I'll just be really upfront with you. I'm a pretty upfront person. It is about politics. It's about political power. It is happening to maintain political power by riling up the base and stopping potential voters from learning the true history and reality of race and racism in our country. So here's what happened after this last election. It became pretty clear that the long-term ability of the far right to win elections at the local level, the state and federal levels is coming into question for two reasons. One, the nation is getting more racially diverse. You all I'm sure are aware that we just had the results from the latest um, census. We have more people of color in our country than ever before. Those people do not usually vote with far right kind of folks, right? And so that is a concern. 
And as white people get really conscious of racial justice, um, they're unwilling to support racist policies and politicians. And so this critical race theory, anti-critical race theory movement is totally aligned with and connected to other things like gerrymandering, um, voter suppression, all these things happening in states across the country to try to basically like uh, take power from um, people who would be uh, concerned about justice. And if schools are teaching the true real history of this country and are asking students, especially white students, right, to have stake in making our country more equitable, this is gonna lead to generations of new kinds of adults, new kinds of white adults who are unwilling to support far right politics, policies and cultural norms. Um, and so this is, this is about power. The goal of this movement is to maintain political and cultural power and schools are a site of that conflict. And as um, those folks know that like how students graduate from our schools and what they know and what they think about justice is gonna matter in how they vote, right? And, and, and matter in that long-term impact in our country. So I just wanna say a little bit about the status of some of the bills. So eight states, this is as of August, 2021. That's when I last looked at, this might not be totally accurate right now. Eight states, Idaho, Oklahoma, Tennessee, Texas, Iowa, New Hampshire, Arizona, and South Carolina have all passed anti-critical race theory legislation. Interestingly, only Idaho's bill even mentions the term critical race theory. Because I just want to be clear, this is not about critical race theory, right? This is about maintaining political power and using critical race theory to do it. Um, 20 more states have introduced similar legislation. Pennsylvania is, Pennsylvania is one of them, as is Michigan, where we're from. Um, House Bill uh, 1532 is the Pennsylvania uh, legislation. It was sponsored um, by the same uh, rep who also um, introduced the transgender uh, ban, ban on transgender athletes. I already mentioned that. And it has a deceptive name. Here's the name of the bill, the Teaching Racial and Universal Equity Act. So it sounds like a good thing, right? I mean, this is like really clever, but it is not a good thing. Um, my understanding, and you all I'm sure probably know more about this from me than me, my understanding is that nothing has happened with that bill so far in um, Pennsylvania, that um, it hasn't come for a vote or anything. So you all might wanna keep your eye on what's gonna happen like that. I mean, with that. But I really wanna emphasize this, this last point. Even in places where bills haven't passed, educators are feeling pressure to shy away from teaching the truth out of fear of backlash. The movement, the anti-critical race theory movement can have the intended effect of shutting down dialogue about race, even without legal wins. Even if nothing happens with this bill, if you all as leaders are scared and your teachers are scared, effectively what you're gonna do in classrooms is gonna be different based on the backlash from this. So the kind of takeaways or sums from this, the majority of people taking up the anti-critical race theory mantle do not know what actual critical race theory is, and they don't honestly have any interest in learning about it or understanding it. Most of the bills we're talking about don't even mention critical race theory because this is not about critical race theory, it's just a political strategy. CRT is simply being used as the latest talking point to hinder movement toward a more inclusive country and honestly to encourage polarization. The parts of critical race theory that seem problematic in the bills being proposed. So there is this language in some of the bills about like teaching white kids to hate themselves. That's not actual critical race theory. There's nowhere in critical race theory. That is the recreation of critical race theory by the far right promoting this movement, right? So the parts that seem problematic aren't critical race theory. And the scare tactic is maybe working to discourage educators from teaching the truth or addressing pressing social issues. So that's kind of where we are. I have this last section on um, what I would say about how leaders should respond. And then I'll take um, some, some questions if you all have any. So again, this is my thought about how leaders should respond. Uh, my caveat is you should check with your lawyers and your PR people. I'm not a PR person, I'm not a lawyer. I'm just a social, I'm a person who cares about justice and has a lot of expertise in that. Um, so I think a few things. One, keep educating yourself. I, I, I said this before, Disinformation campaigns like the anti-critical race theory efforts, they're only possible because we know so little about our history and present reality of racial inequality. And this our collective lack of knowledge that really makes us vulnerable to attack from those who are trying to mandate the telling of lies. I just wanna say, you know, I, I work with a lot of educators. I work with a lot of school leaders. A lot of school leaders have been asking me about critical race theory for months. I don't know, has it been a year now? And a lot of those school leaders, very concerned about critical race theory, asked me about it, haven't picked up one book 
about critical race theory. Like we have to do the reading if we want to be, I mean, I, I use reading in quotes. It could be a book or a video or an article, right? We have to seek the knowledge if we want to be prepared to um, resist the attacks. And like, I just think that this is a big area where um, there's some work for us to do kind of collectively. Two, do not get pulled into the weeds of a bad faith discussion. Highlight the divisive motivations of the opposition. So I said this earlier, I'm gonna say it again. There is not an actual debate happening about whether or not we should teach critical race theory. I actually think that would be a useful conversation to have. The people pushing this don't care about critical race theory. This is just a tactic, right? That all those fears are being wrapped up in. And so if you have someone coming to you ranting about critical race theory, you're not gonna like fix it by saying, oh no, let me just explain to you what critical race theory really is. Um, because that's not really what it's about. And so, you know, if someone's coming to you in good faith, they really have questions, they're genuinely interested, of course you wanna engage with that. But you are not gonna, um, you're not gonna win a bad faith discussion with logic and facts. I just be honest about that. One of the articles I'm gonna recommend as a follow-up, I have a slide, talks about this, talks about how moral panics work and how a lot of people, you know, on the justice side, think if we just explain it better, it'll fix the moral panic and it really doesn't, that's not how it works. That really there are divisive motivations here, that's the intention and it's working and trying to really highlight that I think is important. Three, this is the advice that apparently I'm the only person in America that thinks. <laughs> Don't deny you're teaching critical race theory. I, I don't know what's happening. Like everywhere I go, everybody's like, but we're not teaching critical race theory. In fact, I would say don't mention critical race theory at all because you are using the language of the opposition to make an argument, right? Um, so I just wanna be really clear about this. It is a, there's a good chance you're not teaching anything related to critical race theory. Um, you know, like there's likely no chance you're assigning to students like excerpts from Derek Bell's Race in the Law book. Like you're not doing that probably. Although well, maybe, you know, who's to say? But if you actually care about equity and justice and your district is moving in that direction, you're going to be teaching things inspired by critical race theory. You're going to be telling students that race is not biological, that racism is a system. Those are two things every American should know, right? And so my concern about blanket statements that say we're not teaching critical race theory is um, one, you kind of get trapped in your own thing because if you because what these folks mean by critical race theory is if you mention equity, right? To them, you are whether or not you're assigning Derek Bell. And you're setting up teachers trying to teach the truth. So if you have teachers who are, we have some districts where teachers are actually teaching a race course, or you have teachers where they're trying to talk about diversity in their text, or you have teachers trying to do anything that's culturally relevant. And then leaders say, we're not teaching critical race theory. The message to that teacher is either like, shut it down or, you know, parents are going to say, your superintendent said you're not teaching it, but here's this teacher giving this assignment where they're supposed to, you know, I mean, it just gets very messy. And I think there's no reason to, to, do, to do that. That's my, that's my opinion. I put an asterisk to say context matters. So maybe it is useful if you're having folks at your school board meetings to just repeatedly say, we're not teaching critical race theory. We're not teaching critical race theory to kind of stop the debate. And if you're a district that's not committed to teaching anything about race or racism, then you're not teaching it. I mean, that would just be fact. You could just say you're not. But I just want to push you all to think a little bit more deeply about like how you, what you put out in the messaging and, and what that says to, to, um, to your teachers in particular and also to, to the families you serve. Um, I had another thought about that. Now I'm losing it. Oh, I'm sure it'll come back to me. So what should you do? This is what I think you should do. Reframe the debate using your own terminology. Identify what you are for in ways that are as universal as possible. So here's an example of what I might say. You know, unfortunately, there are some people out there who are using obscure terminology, I wouldn't say the thing, to try to deliberately confuse people. I don't know, you know, they're trying to confuse you. This is what we're actually about. It's really actually simple. We're about serving all children, giving students the tools to prepare them to live in a diverse multicultural world, ensuring every student is treated fairly, making sure our schools are safe places where no one is bullied because of who they are, making sure students from all backgrounds have healthy self-esteem and feel good about themselves. That's white students too, right? Empowering all students to take action to make the world a better place, making sure all students see themselves and people like them reflected in what they learn at school, making sure everyone has an equal opportunity to succeed, teaching our students accurate information about our history, helping students learn about all kinds of people so they can 
build connections with people from all over the world. I'm not saying you have to say all of these, but like, what is the thing you can say about what you're about that is honest and true, that is universal, that is not um, giving into the talking points of the people who are trying to interrupt your, your practice, right? You might also um, reframe the debate by using your own terminology and name anti-racism if it's appropriate for you to do so. Um, oh shoot, there's a typo there, sorry about that. Um, so, you know, like, depending on the kind of place you are, you might actually be committed to some equity work. So you might say something like this. We know that achieving these goals, the goals we just mentioned, right? You're gonna name what you're doing in these general universal terms. We know achieving these goals will include learning some hard things about our past and present. Learning about racism is one of these hard things, but we are confident that our students are smart enough and capable enough to do it. We know some of these things might feel new, but we also know that learning to think critically about hard things is a core part of what it means to be an educated person. You might add something like this. This is just an example. You're not, you know, you don't have to say it exactly like this. We know from experience and research that when we don't engage students in these conversations in our classrooms, they do it on their own anyway, without the benefit of being guided by adults who can help scaffold that learning and interrupt misinformation. So some of you may have already experienced Maybe some of your districts are in the news for like racist Snapchats, right? I wrote a whole book, it's called Those Kids Our School is about racial, I mean, part of it is about racial interactions among students and what they're doing when adults aren't looking, right? We've seen some of the results in these student interactions and viral media coverage of racist incidents among students in school. It is our goal to make sure all of our students have a strong enough sense of self to learn the true history of our country. We are confident that all of our students will be stronger, better, more considerate for it. Or you might say something like this, if you have already done some policies. We're committed to being the district where racism, sexism, homophobia, et cetera, will not be tolerated. We know the strong majority of our families support this commitment. And I wanna emphasize that, because back to what I said earlier, a lot of the people coming to these school board meetings aren't even parents in these districts, right? Um, we know that making sure this is a place free of racism will require talking to students about what it is so they can identify it and interrupt it. And then if accurate, we might add, this is why on the state, our board committed to you know, whatever policy. So just think about how do you frame what you're doing using the words that you're already using in your place. If you haven't been talking about critical race theory in your place, don't start talking about critical race theory. Talk about what you've already been talking about, right? Five, highlight the legal responsibilities of schools and districts to address issues of equity and things like test scores um, mandated by federal and state governments. I just wanna say, you know, it's so funny to me that on one of those memes, it said, if your school is talking about equity, they're doing critical race theory. Like you all legally have to talk about equity. Like you're legally obligated to do that. Um, so some of this stuff is not even about curriculum. It's like, you have to report in certain ways about how you are educating students by subgroups and subpopulations, right? And so like, there's no kind of way around that in a public school system or in a, in a charter school system, in any school system. Really. Um, six. I like the censorship and government overreach inherent in the anti-critical race theory movement. So the folks leading this movement around other issues would very much support local control of education, local control of schools. And what they are asking for is for governors to ban or decide what local school districts can teach. Total overreach, right? Totally problem. Seven, communicate with legislators, leaders, and community members in your sphere of influence. So I really am encouraging you all, speak out against the anti-critical race theory movement in your local districts and with state leaders. Be as loud as the opposition. So one of the problems is that there are people who are actually fine with schools talking about race, but they're not the ones showing up at the school board meetings. And so like, we can't get distracted by the squeaky wheel. We have to like start being that squeaky wheel. And I would just say, follow the youth. This is your state right here. District reverses ban on books by authors of color after students fought back, that students are really protesting against what's happening and we have to join them. And I just wanna say, if the reaction to the fear of, to the anti-critical race theory movement is to essentially ban books that are not written by white people. I mean, that's just like straight racism, y'all, right? That's just, that's just racism. And so um, we have to really be willing to say like, we're not about that and this is what we are about. And maybe the youth will save us, they're willing to say it and, and, and good to these young folks who um, make this happen. And then finally, um, anticipate pushback and stay on message. You know, people are gonna be mad regardless of what you do. You gotta focus on what your message is. Do not get distracted by the squeakiest wheels. Do not get 
down in the weeds trying to argue fine points with people who are not really interested in that. You know, this is really a fight for the future of our nation and really a fight about what the purpose of schooling is, right? Um, and so I encourage you, if you all aren't familiar with, um, there's a kind of Teach the Truth campaign by the Zen Education Project. Educators around the country are signing pledges and starting movements to say, I will teach the truth, right? Um, and you might want to consider how you you can organize, how your school districts might be a part of that kind of fight. Um, this quote from Martin Luther King Jr.'s letting from, letter from Birmingham jail, which if you haven't read that, y'all need to just like read it today, right? If that's not something you've read, the letter from Birmingham jail, it's not that long. He says, one has not only a legal, but a moral responsibility to obey just laws. Conversely, one has a moral responsibility to disobey unjust laws. And what is happening with the critical race theory movement, the anti-critical race theory movement is really an effort to, to, to pass unjust laws. And so um, this movement, you know, we the undersigned educators refuse to lie to young people about US history and current events. And so if that's not something you've seen or, or looked into, I encourage you to do that. So this is just the summary of all of them if you wanna take a screenshot, but um, those are the eight things. And I really do just think that this is it's a fight for the future of our nation, y'all. It really is. And um, um, I, I just hope you remember that, think about what side of history you wanna be on as you think about how you respond to this. Here's some additional uh, references. Uh, I wish I could easily put these in the chat. I'll just actually maybe leave this here um, cause I'm gonna do just some Q and A, but I'll just leave this here so you can note these if you wanna take a look. All right, I'm happy to do some questions if anyone has any. While we're waiting on questions, I did also, um, Shayla, pop your article that you wrote in the um, chat about critical race theory, panic reveals why white students must be included in our equity efforts. They can grab that as well. Yeah, read that too. Great, thanks. Shayla, are we going to be able to get access to this PowerPoint? Like, in other words- um, I have it, actually been sending it around to people, so- uh, I'd, I'd be interesting, to, interested in receiving it because I'm, I'm getting old and forgetful. So I'd like to, uh, and I don't take notes super fast. Okay, um, I'll, I'll talk to Connie um, about how we might make that happen. Okay, thank you. As long as uh, you're willing to share the PowerPoint with us, um, Dr. Griffin, uh, we we will be sending out the recording to the folks who registered and uh, we can include the PowerPoint with that. Anyone else questions, concerns, thoughts? Just a couple comments about um, that it was informative, it was uh, outstanding, uh, people thanking you. Thank you, thank you. I did wanna wonder if, Serena, I know last time when we did this at MASA, you said a little bit about responding at school board meetings, kind of, sure. I don't know if you anything about that. Sure. Um, just Shayla and I were having some, some conversation, it even came up yesterday in our Beyond Equity training that we were doing yesterday, is for us to, as leaders to remember that this is a season of disagreement. This is a season of division. And so we had this very kind of really truth conversation that a lot of people that are coming and fighting against critical race theory or the work that you're doing in your district are really just upset about anything and are latching onto everything that they think that they can get some momentum on. So with that being said, we're just encouraging you um, if you, know this is coming at a future board meeting, as we've shared with our leaders, have a plan in place. Um, I'm sure you've seen in your state, just like we've seen in our state and across the country, these meetings tend to be really divisive. We've had people spitting on people, arguing almost fit fist fights. Um, so have a plan in place uh, from a security perspective. Um, and just know that, uh, I, I think Shayla says it so well, this is not an argument that you want to get into the weeds on with people that don't intend to recognize the truth and are really just trying to create their own noise. Um, their own noise allows for them not to be able to hear the truth. So stay focused, follow those eight points that Shayla um, put on the screen, 
share them with your leadership team. I think it's critical that you're building principles um, also are able to have these conversations with their staff and with um, parents that might come to them um, first and know that Shayla and or I will be a resource for you. Uh, we may be in another state, but this is all of our work and we just are thankful that you guys asked us to come today and are willing to support you in any way that we can. Well, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Griffin and Dr. Shivers. And, and uh, just to conclude, I'm uh, going to read what Brian Osborne has posted uh, in chat because uh, it truly was my sentiments. I know I had the opportunity to uh, attend uh, this webinar when the Massachusetts Association was offering it. And I, I agree that uh, this is strong affirmation and appreciation, and it is a very clear and thorough ex explanation and call to action. And um, so we thank all of our attendees uh, for being here, as well as uh, Dr. Uh, Griffin and Dr. Shivers uh, for sharing the information, because I know so many of you are working so hard uh, for equity and, and justice uh, within your school districts. And um, I'm hopeful that the suggestions that uh, were provided will be helpful to you as, uh, as you work to reframe the debate. Uh, so um, thank you so much again for joining us.